we're happy to have uh, two of uh, uh, folks with us, John Lastwick and David Nogueira, uh, David Nogueira, sorry, uh, who have been uh, very instrumental in the NST program in regards to helping to uh, interpret NST and apply it and make it work for the many grantees that have used this program. So welcome to all of you. Uh, our objective today is not so much to convince uh, NSP grantees that they should do NSP, uh, do lease purchase, but if they do, is to arm them with the tools uh, so that they can do it successfully. Uh, in hearing this presentation and what the panelists have to say, uh, it might be that uh, a participant might decide not to do lease purchase, and we consider that a success as well because uh, we find too many uh, nonprofits and others uh, doing lease purchase without the appropriate tools and are not doing very well with them. So our objective is to arm everyone with the tools to do lease purchase successfully. Now, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to do a short summary uh, which basically summarizes what we presented last spring uh, just to uh, describe these crucial elements, uh, give a, and then turn it over to our panelists to give a uh, concrete example of what they're doing with a uh, lease purchase uh, and using NFT as the funding source and uh, describing their program, then talking about some crucial elements uh, that I will be reviewing, uh, and that is selection of the lead purchaser and the support provided. And then uh, Bill Brett is going to address a very uh, key element in the success of any lead purchase program, and that is having the capacity to do asset management. And then we'll talk about other additional resources that uh, you can uh, look to to uh, be successful with lead purchase. So uh, we should start uh, by defining what we mean by lease purchase because there are many definitions and many ways that lease purchase is used. And in this context, uh, we're referring to it as a clear leasing period where uh, rent is paid, and then at the end of that period or at some point in that leasing period, an actual transfer of title is made uh, in a sale, uh, with a sales option. Now, there are various uh, lengths of lease purchase. Uh, there is one that we refer to as the front four, which is less than a year. And it usually refers to an arrangement where there's just one more thing that the lease purchaser needs to nail down before going to closing, and, and they will be able to do that uh, sometimes within six months and certainly no more than 12 months. So typical short-term lease purchases, though, are one to five years. Uh, please note that with NSP, because it follows the home affordability guidelines, only allows three years. Uh, there are also those lease purchase arrangements that are much longer, and they're usually and uh, actually always combined with low-income housing tax credits, and they're 15 years. So there are different lengths that lease purchase can be, and uh, there are also different types of lease purchase programs. Uh, most are developer-driven, meaning that the developer goes out, purchases the property, rehabs it, or builds it, and then looks for a buyer or a lease purchaser. Uh, there are another type of lease purchase arrangement where the buyer seeks out the property under certain guidelines, then the sponsor of a lease purchase program, purchases it on their behalf, leases it for a short period of time, and then sells it to them uh, within the prescribed period. Uh, the example we're using today actually uses the buyer-driven approach. So just to give you background in terms of lease purchase and NSP, um, there's what we refer to as formal arrangements or informal arrangements. And what we mean by this is that uh, because home it is used as the affordability, uh, defines affordability and compliance periods as the safe harbor in NFC. Uh, it 
we follow home guidelines when it comes to these purchases. And that guideline is found in the home ownership section of home uh, because it considers we purchase an actual home ownership program. And all the issues uh, regarding uh, the capture, how it's entered in DRG law, uh, follows pretty much standard uh, home requirements. But others, more informally, may start out as a rental unit and that with some intention, and sometimes more deliberate than others, of selling it either to the, the tenant that occupies it or eventually to someone who will buy it. And that's a more informal approach. And uh, as we'll see in our example today, that's what's being used um, with uh, the uh, CDC folks, uh, mainly because in the, uh, in the beginning of the NST program, there was some ambiguity around this. And so uh, doing it rental was a safe way to go. Now, as I mentioned, uh, entering it into DRGR requires for the formal uh, lease purchase that it be entered as a home ownership unit with a note that it presents to that it is lease purchase. Uh, or if it's done informally as a rental unit, it's entered as a rental with some note that uh, this may eventually be sold. So that's what you need to know uh, in regards to regulation. Now I want to talk about the seven major areas that need to be paid attention to if any sponsored lease purchase is going to be successful. And they are seven. And it starts with uh, clearly understanding marketing. And often groups are uh, try out home ownership, and when that doesn't work, uh, they try a reach for lease purchase without taking a closer look at the way they're marketing. And so the first issue is lease purchase is not, then finding those lease purchasers may be problematic too. So marketing is still key for lease purchase as well. Uh, secondly, the worst thing to do is to back into uh, lease purchase. Have a plan. Uh, third is because not all these purchasers go to, to actually purchase, uh, there is required an exit strategy. Fourth, um, lease purchase requires as much diligence to selection as underwriting a home buyer. And in fact, it's a little trickier, which we shall talk about. Fifth, uh, have a lease option agreement that has the ability to terminate the relationship legally and fairly. Six, capture all costs uh, because all phases of the transaction need to be looked at up front to determine its economic feasibility, and that could be done with a three-part performance. And then finally, seven, it has sufficient capacity. We're going to emphasize property management today. Uh, but this also applies to having the capacity to provide pretty intense home ownership counseling. So now I'm going to take each one of these and explain them a little uh, more in depth. The first is reinvigorate marketing. Uh, clearly, our market has changed in the last three years, and uh, we need to decide whether we're going to keep following the market down or we're going to attempt to influence it to turn around. And that's a key decision to make in terms of how we position uh, our marketing. Uh, it also influences how we set sale prices. And this really requires going back to marketing basics. Things that happened that worked four or five years ago do not work today, so we need to rethink how we do our marketing. Um, despite our best efforts at marketing, and uh, maybe we've added things for COVID deal, we've uh, Develop uh, track of financing, or we develop good partnership relations, particularly with realtors who know how to handle affordable housing. Uh, we are still unable to sell it. Uh, we can, we do have other options of reducing the price, although that's not uh, good at leading the market. Uh, or we could increase down payment assistance. Uh, we might end up uh, doing rental or lease purchase. And what we decide about either of these has their own uh, implications. So the second important 
uh, thing to remember about these coaches is have a plan. The worst thing to do is to back in to these coaches at, out of desperation because we've had properties finished and sitting there for many months, maybe even years, and we want to get them occupied uh, because we want to change that vacancy um, uh, tab on our DRGR. Um, that is not a uh, appropriate reason to do these purchase uh, unless we have a plan, a plan that helps make sure that all our partners or in large organizations, all the staff are on the same page because it's all written out very clearly. And um, this plan or design, uh, we think it's best translated in a policy and procedures manual which we will talk about a little later as to where you can find a model on the NSP website. Uh, a plan helps us to coordinate all the various variables. Uh, there are lots of uh, uh, various parts, moving parts to a lease purchase program, and it's helpful up front to decide how they're all going to be uh, coordinated. Uh, having a plan also helps us address regulatory issues. For example, how are we going to do the sale recapture? Uh, how do we determine the affordability period? All that has to be structured in advance and laid out in a good design. And finally, um, uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have a good example of a, uh, a lease purchase policy and procedures manual in the NSP toolkit. We can just take that and adapt it to our own circumstances. So have a plan. Third is have an exit strategy. Even the best lease purchase programs in the country are only 95% successful, and it's more typically 70 to 80%. The best are at 95%. That still means that 5 to 10 to 15, 20, 20% of the folks who start out intending to purchase actually do not. And so having a mechanism uh, to terminate the relationship uh, is important, uh, and, and having the understanding that that may happen and everybody agreeing uh, to that happening. Uh, the other thing, though, is to try to prevent uh, having to go through this kind of action by uh, careful selection, which we will talk about next, and then providing lots of support, which we will talk about in the, uh, by one of the panelists. And then third, uh, it's helpful to have good financial incentives. For example, in many of these purchase programs, there's an accumulated kind of uh, savings or set aside of funds for closing. That kind of a rebate being offered at sale is one financial example of one financial incentive. Obviously, if the uh, lease purchaser does not go through to sale, they don't receive that incentive. Another one is how the PITI is structured in relationship to rent. Um, we want that PITI to be lower than rent so people can actually see a reduction of their housing costs. And there are many more, uh, and many of which we can think of. The fourth is, as I mentioned, is has very clear and predetermined selection criteria. They need to be written. There has to be some objectivity to them. For example, using the FICO score, which is used by lenders to underwrite home ownership, uh, they could be used for these purchases as well. For example, if the current market or score for FICO credit scores are 640, uh, perhaps setting a lease purchase FICO score at that score is going to rise during the leasing period and reach 640 uh, within uh, the term so that they would then be eligible for a mortgage at the end, uh, but at least we have some standard at which we will not go below. This needs to be a balance between prudent rental criteria, which usually are the foundation of uh, lease purchase criteria, and current mortgage standards. So it's not quite, they're not mortgage ready. Uh, and that's the reason that they are in a lease purchase situation. And uh, so there needs to be something worked out that is somewhere in between. 
and each group needs to decide their own criteria based on their own circumstances. Sometimes this has something to do with their own goals. For example, if an organization sees lease purchase as part of their continuum of assisting families along a continuum of different credit and income needs, uh, that will be different than someone who really wants to get the house sold as soon as possible and are trying to select folks that are near, near ready or almost mortgageable. Uh, sometimes this, these criteria will relate to how much risk the organization is going to take and what kind of success rate that they expect. So uh, having that, those criteria written down that the, the whoever is making the selection uh, have at their disposal is another crucial element. The fifth, as mentioned in the exit strategy, is having a lease that is legally and fairly terminated, uh, not only when the lease purchaser violates normal rental standards, but if they are unable to fulfill program requirements and uh, become a homeowner. Our recommendation is that a renewable lease uh, can uh, be helpful in dealing with local tenant landlord laws, and um, uh, we have a model of that in the toolkit. Uh, usually, the option to uh, purchase uh, amount is determined at the beginning, and expectations around maintenance and making progress in becoming more visible is built in. It's helpful to have a lease purchase guidebook so lease purchasers understand the difference between home ownership and lease purchase and what's expected during the lease period. And of course, um, royal requirements are needed to avoid displacement. And six is it's important to understand the, all the economics of the deal so the organization is not losing money at, um, and uh, is actually hopefully coming out ahead when all is said and done at the sale of the property. This also helps us to develop those uh, financial incentives and ensures uh, how we determine affordability. The seventh and final one is have the capacity to handle all this, especially home ownership counseling and scattered site property management, uh, which we're going to talk about, uh, uh, Bill Red is going to address as one of the tenants. So uh, before we get to the panelists, we just wanted to see if there are any questions related to uh, lease purchase um, and so that uh, we can be clear about the type of lease purchase that we're talking about. So we can take questions at this point. Very good. And let me remind folks how to ask your questions. Uh, you can click your raise hand button to ask verbally. You can also submit written questions, and we do have a question from uh, Tayani, and let me uh, let me unmute you, Tayani. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yes. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from uh, the Atlanta metropolitan area with the Atlanta Neighborhood Development Partnership. Terrific. Um, Hi, Tayani. Hi, David. How are you? It's good to hear your voice again. Thank you very much. Uh, should I just go ahead with my question? Yep. yep. Okay. Well, um, AMVP is a, a nonprofit developer. We have multiple industry contracts in our metropolitan area. Uh, the majority of our work to date has been for sale um, housing, and we're just now getting to the point where we've got some lingering properties in the portfolio where the the jurisdictions, be they the city or the county government that we have a contract with, are beginning to be more open to allow us to move to a lease purchase um, or rent or rent to own strategy. And so we're at the stage now of setting rents, and um, it, we're, we're having some trouble getting um, approval from our jurisdictions. I think because they're afraid that they don't know what measure to evaluate um, them by or how to determine whether the rent that is set is acceptable with NSP guidelines. And so we found some help on the uh, HUD NSP uh, help.info website and have used that guidance 
uh, with the home standards sort of going through the process of taking the level of the fair market rent and the 65% of AMI rent as a guidance, but um, needed some help in, in going forward. This is an excellent question and comes up uh, uh, quite regularly. But, uh, the first decision to be made is, are you going to do this as a uh, lease purchase program under the home, home ownership rules, uh, or are you going to do it under rental? If you do it under home ownership, the lease purchase section in home ownership under mm -hmm. home, then uh, the setting the rent uh, is not determined by FMR. Mm -hmm. It actually, the, the PITI will be at the point of sale, and that's what determines whether it's affordable or not. Mm -hmm. Then then the rent could be set uh, at any amount that is uh, reasonable to market. Uh, one of the pieces of advice that we give is set the rent higher than the PITI as a financial incentive. Mm -hmm. Now, if you decide that you're going to make this a rental unit, uh, then uh, you're, you're, you, you have much more limitations as to how you set the rent, and you have to use the rental standards in home, which is high and low rent, and uh, depending on what incomes you're targeting, uh, uh, that, that will pretty much dictate how those rents are set. So the first decision is, is this lease purchased as a home ownership unit or is this a rental unit that you think you might sell at some point and call it lease purchase? And that's, and one determines whether you're using home ownership home guidelines or you're using rental home guidelines. Okay. Can I help? Yes, big help. Thank you. You're welcome. Very good. Let's go now to, uh, thank you for that, Tiani. And, uh, let's go to Yannick. Hi, hey, Yannick. Hello. 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 Hello, hear. this is Yannick Lender from Neighborhood Housing Services of South Florida. Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the performer, uh, in a, this purchase program, you said it needs to have three parts? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd be very happy to. Uh, basically, uh, lease purchase requires us to look at not just the development phase and not just the sale phase, but what happens in between or the op operational phase. And it's helpful to combine all three in one pro forma to see how uh, when one variable in the development or sales phase affects what happens in the operational phase. Uh, this will help us better determine uh, how the economics work in the beginning all the way to sale because each phase will influence uh, how we structure the subsidy, how we structure the sale price, how we structure the PITI, uh, what money we have available during the operations for any debt service, if any. Um, it helps us to determine whether a um, an assumable mortgage that's amortizing the principal and interest, whether that works, and uh, often it doesn't in most markets. Uh, but that three-part pro forma will help us see that. There's actually an example of one on the HUD NSP toolkit. It's a little outdated, and we hope maybe at some point we will up, uh, be updating that. Uh, but if you want more on that, I can certainly uh, do some follow-up and provide a more recent example of a three-part performance. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And at this point, that's all the questions I see. So... Uh, Shall we move on to community ventures? Uh, let's do that. Okay. So let me just give a little introduction and uh, introduce our two panelists that are going to talk about uh, their NSP lease purchase program. Um, uh, this is a group that's been doing lease purchase for quite a while. 
and had quite a bit of experience with it. And when NSP, NSP came along, they uh, uh, wanted to use NSP with these purchases as well. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is a good example of a consumer or buyer-driven approach, and uh, they are using the more informal uh, uh, arrangement with home, whereby they are renting it at, with the intention at some point uh, of selling it. So we have uh, two uh, panelists uh, that are going to be doing uh, the presentation, Donna Major, who is Senior Executive and Vice President, and Keisha Kyler, who is the Director of Home Buyer Education and Counseling. So, Donna, why don't you uh, take us from here? Very good. Good afternoon, Dave, and good afternoon, participants. Um, CBC started in the lease purchase business in 1997 when I was first with CBC, and our first contract application was one page and a quarter, and that's how we got into the lease purchase business. We were very active in lease purchase through about 2007, and then um, things happened. In fact, there's somebody on this phone call, I believe, that knows that whole dark history, but NSP came up. We were very excited. Uh, we consciously went into the program uh, trying to do the maximum number of lease purchases because our model requires us to have a client first. We could not go out and just buy homes. That's not allowed uh, in our agency. So by putting the maximum number of lease purchases into the program before we hit Davis Bacon was a serious intent from the beginning. Um, Right now, what I advise and what we have found is your PJ, I happen to have the word state up here, but your PJ has to be a critical partner. If they don't understand or don't believe in lease purchase, you've got enough to fight. We're very blessed because our basic lease purchase design came from a boy who then went on to the state to become director of NSP. So she understood from the very beginning what we were trying to do and was able to really help us make it work. So um, I think we had somebody already mentioned that their PJ doesn't understand. Well, their PJ needs to talk to our PJ because they, we definitely uh, have a, our state understands what we're trying to do. We use our original lease purchase design for how it had been um, changed up to about two 2007 for our NSP program, because as many of you know, when we all jumped in, rules were kind of scattered. Well, we knew what had worked for us, so we went forward with that design. Um, we did set up the program using fair market rent solidified. We put the fair market rents were below the client's eventual PITI, and we were able to fill that gap by having the client they pay the additional money, and that went into a fund so that at the end of their rental period, they had down payment and closing costs. So they basically are paying the same in rent that they would be paying when they buy the house. So it was really important to us to be able to set aside these funds, which we had not able to do in our original lease purchase. Um, and I should say, one of the things we're allowed to do is we had 100% financing from NSP and our lease purchase houses, so we're not paying interest. That has made it much, much easier to do this program. Um, we do require our consumers do uh, select the property. Uh, it, was, it was a little bit tougher than under our current lease purchase because they could only shop in certain locations. Um, and we had to have certain conditions. In our original lease purchase, we tried to buy as little as possible, but we did a lot of work. Because we were buying for first time, we found that they needed a whole lot of work. Um, the client had to submit their good faith deposit and sign a purchase agreement when we bought the house. 
and their sales price was included in the purchase agreement. So they knew from the get-go what the house was going to cost. Our lease agreement, our program right now is structured according to the home regs um, up to three years to qualify. Leases are written in one year uh, format, so there's an opportunity to check on the clients and make sure that things are going well. Uh, one of the things we're able to do because of NFT funding is we're able to set aside maintenance reserves. And even though we did extensive remodeling in some of these houses, we've had some interesting things turn up, and we've had the funds to fix them. Now, clients are required to handle all basic maintenance. They have to take care of the yard, disrupt the grass, broken windows, uh, fixing, if they make a home and all, they fix it. Um, so they have a lot of responsibility in it. Now, we have to return program income to the state, uh, working on an annual basis because it's constantly shifting. So, at the end of the uh, fiscal year, we will return our program income to the state, and we can do a mortgage for the client when they transition that we can have 50% of NFT funds in the house uh, as, a, as a second mortgage. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Keisha, and... Let me get her set up. Then we're changing seats. I have better computer screens than she does, so. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Keisha Kyle, Director of Home Ownership, Education, and Counseling. And um, in the selection of the lease purchase client, um, the requirements for, the, for purchasing, including the cash and income level, we required a, a deposit at time of CC's real estate, CBC's real estate contract, $500 for clients at or under 50% AMI, and $1,000 for clients over the 50% AMI. Now, the income level um, we had was at or under 120% AMI, and then 38% of those were restricted to low income. So, uh, um, 38% of the 50 of the low AMI. Um, on the credit, we, uh, we looked at um, a minimum score, uh, a mid score of 575 for the mid score. Now, this was when the, when the um, credit um, mid score was at 620, when all they needed was a 620 to get a loan. Um, so, we were looking at 575. We looked at debt to ratio, um, and I reviewed that, and with the in-house lender, and under that it was really, it was a case-by-case scenario, you know, looking at um, any liens or judgments that they had on them, looking at what they actually, what was actually on the credit. So our in-house lender and I, when it came to that point, we really studied the credit report a lot together to see um, if, if he thought that it could, that it would be, be okay in three years. I um, didn't want to put any stress on the client um, to try to pay off those things because that will cause, that can cause people to drop out of the program. So when I looked at their income, even though they approved on their growth, we took their net and put it into the budget and showed them what, what money they actually had to pay off these items um, to get credit worthy. And a lot of times, a lot of people didn't want to be under that stress, so, and you don't want to put that stress on them. Um, bankruptcies had to be discharged for at least a year, no foreclosures, and current um, rent for at least 12 months. So um, a lot of the uh, requirements were done under home buyers, under the requir requirements so if you were purchasing a home, with a little bit of leniency. Now, um, under the leasing period for counseling, uh, the first thing that I required the uh, clients to do was to take the financial fitness. And this was before they were even selected for our lease purchase because that's why I see if the client is even um, serious enough about it. If they're willing to come to a class on Saturday to find out how to budget and do their credit report, then that's the first step in showing how serious they are. 
Um, during, um, I don't know, I think you guys, um, a lot of you have your model under the developer first. You, you already have the homes. We didn't. So during the period that the home was doing rehab, we started to run our own counseling to get them used to meeting with a housing counselor once a month or every two months, depending on the case. Um, they did, um, once they're ready for the home purchase, then we do the home buyer education. So talk to the counselor on the phone to see um, if everything is still on track. Then um, I have ran into some hiccups with the economy. I've had, um, hello? I had someone lose their job, so um, we do, um, and we just know this going to take him a little longer. He has a job, and we assisted in helping him find a job, and he has a job, so we just know it's going to take a little, little longer. Um, with the post-purchase counseling, we're still working on trying to get people to come to, to that. Um, uh, I have, um, I'm taking suggestions on that from people as to how, how to get them. If they purchase the house, um, so we're trying to get them to come in and learn how to do home maintenance, and that's something that we're currently working on. With the, um, during the period of going through all of this, we did learn a lot. I know I learned a lot. Um, some of the adjustments that we had to make, we had, we had to deal with, it was difficult in purchasing houses from services and the quality of the houses. As Donna mentioned, um, trying to find uh, foreclosed homes that didn't need a lot of work, it was difficult in that. Um, we had difficulty in finding properties in the required census tract um, just because of the foreclosure of foreclosure rates, there were certain areas that were higher than others, and we had to focus on those areas. And um, it was difficult finding um, houses that didn't need a lot of work in those areas. We had to mistake. Sometimes the before rules had solidified. Um, so we were, there was constant change. So I think you guys are really getting a jump start on, on uh, from where we started from. We had to... A lot of rules changed throughout our process, but it was a great learning experience. And because we had to move so fast um, due to our program requirements, the client first um, had people in the pipeline that ultimately had to be removed. Um, during the, 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 the beginning of the, of the process, we were building a, a pipeline of clients. And when I got in there and looked at some of those clients, we realized that those clients really didn't need to be in the lease purchase program, but um, it was something that, that we were able to address, and um, like I said, just a great le learning experience. Another thing, since we have the clients in the lease purchase program and funds are being cut, uh, we had to find a way to come up with down payment and closing costs, so we did find an IDA here in, um, in Kentucky that's offered in Fayette County in, our, in Lexington where we have our uh, NST lease purchase. And what we are doing that, that money that Donna was talking about that's over the, um, the fair market rent value, we're using that and putting that into an IBA account for the clients and they designated that for home ownership. So when they're ready to purchase the home, they, they can put up to $2,000 in there and get a $2 match for every dollar. So that ends up with $6,000 at the end of the purchase, lease purchase period to, um, have both the down payment and closing costs, and that's a great incentive as well. If you can find a program like that to try to help them with their down payment money, that's a great incentive for them to stay in the program and to be serious about working on their credit. Um, Dave, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Let's see if there's questions. So, Dave, we have an expert on the line. I, I saw Ann Chaney had come on the line, and she was the original writer of our NSP program, so she may have something to add. Um, not the NSP, it was under the lease purchase, but she sure recognized it when we, uh, when we sent in on our application. Shall I unmute Ann? Only if Ann has anything to add. 
Okay, and if you have anything to add, just uh, click your raise hand button. Otherwise, we will uh, keep you somewhat anonymous. <laughs> and, uh, I won't make her do it, but if any of you are having problems with your PJs, they really need to talk to our, our Department of Local Government because they understand these purchases. <laughs> So we do have we do have a question here uh, from uh, Tayani again, and let me unmute Tayani. Hello. Hi. Okay. Hello. I am um, uh, again. I'm with the Atlanta Neighborhood Development Partnership. We have a small lease purchase a program where we've already uh, acquired the properties. Uh, we're getting ready to expand to properties that we've acquired and renovated in the NST program in various jurisdictions uh, that perhaps have not sold as quickly as some of the other properties in, in inventory. Um, and uh, we've, in our small sort of pilot program, we've had a hard time getting residents to be consistent about participating in their one-on-one -on -one training. We have um, a monthly one-on-one -on -one um, home buyer training component uh, for our residents, and um, we do partner actually with um, third parties that are hard to housing counseling agents purchasing from other sort of sister nonprofits in our area. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to enforce or encourage participation with our residents? Are these are, are they already in the um, in the homes, or are these uh, these people that you're putting into your pipeline for a possible repurchase plan? These are people that are already in the homes, and they started. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I had same that same issue with a couple with a couple of people, and really, it's um, it's <laughs> are you feel like a babysitter? On, on yeah. some, some levels, um, instead of having them come in all the time, because on a, uh, on a monthly schedule, I found that having people come in every month may have been a little bit demanding from them. So I have gone down to doing phone calls and checking in on them over the phone. So that's one way that I have I found that makes that it has made the participation better, and I can keep up with them. Um, instead of requiring them to come in, um, they do a, a monthly phone call to check in because sometimes a lot of things that don't change within that month. Now I don't know what you're doing under your um, under under your um, with your one-on-one -on -one counseling each month, but I found that a lot of things weren't changing for me uh, yeah, every month. Right. Yeah, so the the follow-up phone calls made it easier for me and I could ask them, has anything changed what's going on in the household? If they say that something has happened, something's different, then we'll start for them to come in and we can meet and, and figure out what's going on and we do our action plan. But um, it's helped a whole lot for me. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If I could just add, uh, Kent, a couple comments. Um, one is... Uh, in the CDC model, the counseling is in-house, and I think because uh, it's in-house, there is more of an incentive to uh, make the program work as a lease purchase program. Um, when one has to partner with a counseling agency, um, I, 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 I find that to be because it's one step removed. A little bit more difficult, um, although it can have, it can work. The issue is uh, how the counseling agency is set up and understands uh, the lease purchase program and how different it is from their normal home ownership program. Uh, so there might be some tweaking there in mm -hmm. terms of how the counseling agency is working with uh, A and D P. Okay. Oh, Dave, I think you're exactly right because we have one client that really doesn't want to talk to Keisha, but we have an employee on staff that he'll always talk to. When we need to check with them, we have a different employee call, and you can do that in-house because you have the flexibility 
to, to do those types of things where if you don't, if you're outsourcing it. So, Ann Cheney did raise her hand, so let me uh, unmute her. Hi, Ann. Hello. How are you? How are you today? Um, I guess I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. CBC is doing a, a great job with this lease purchase program. It does require um, a lot of willingness by uh, uh, the state, the state jurisdiction, or whomever to structure um, a program that, that actually is workable on both ends, one from the funding agency perspective to make sure that the program adheres to all the applicable regulations, but that you work within those to the maximum extent feasible, provide that housing partner with the greatest flexibility to get a good tenant in that house the first time around. Um, because the ultimate goal is to, to convert that unit to home ownership. Um, and, and if it's, if it's done improperly, it's, it's a, a nightmare fraught with landmines for everyone concerned. And one of the things that, that, that I did want to note, and, and, uh, uh, we work very closely with community ventures to do this, was to make sure that, uh, you know, when, you know, when you have a prospective lease purchase client, you have to get that move-in notice to them because if you evict that client for anything other than cause, you're apt to trigger relocation requirements. And so it, it, because it's a programmatic noncompliance as opposed to eviction for cause, that's, that's a pretty important uh, step in the process. Um, and just sort of to wrap up, I guess <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to doink Donna a little bit here. Uh, for better or for worse, I, I actually had the, the, the uh, opportunity to comment on the state's action plan uh, for the NFP program, and, and that was sort of the point at which the state asked if I were interested in this program. And, I'm still debating whether or not that yes was a, a, a good answer or a bad answer, but I guess. So <laughs> are we, Ann. <laughs> now, it, it's working really well. It works better under NSP than it worked before. It, it does, and, you know, I, 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 I understand that, you know, I, I think maybe I even said this on a webinar last week that I expect a number of the state's units to convert to home ownership because of the challenges in, in uh, first mortgage financing. And that's not an automatic default so much as it is a recognition of substantive changes in the marketplace. Folks that are credit worthy and, and, and mortgage ready, at this point many of them are gun shy about purchasing homes. And folks that, exactly in the case that Donna gave, who were otherwise credit worthy or would have been uh, at a 575 jumping up to a 620, um, we have a lot of folks in the pipeline that, that when the secondary market uh, underwriting criteria changed were no longer mortgage ready. And, and providing folks that have worked very, very hard and very diligent uh, an opportunity to achieve home ownership through lease purchase is uh, certainly a, a, a good way to, to accomplish the purposes of NST, which are to get houses back into occupancy, regardless whether that be lease purchase, rental, or home ownership. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Ann. Appreciate that. Now, she is the expert. If anybody wants to know what our program looks like, I'll send you Ann's original design. Yeah, and, and if you had not understood the program when we applied for it, I mean, no telling what kind of heartache we would have gone through to try and do some lease purchase units. I think the PJ understanding it and being committed to it is critical. We do have a couple more questions here um, that we can take, and then we'll move on to Bill Brett of Columbus Housing Partnership. But let's first go to uh, Diane Hart. Hi, Diane. Where are you from? Hi. Hello. 
I'm calling from Tampa, Florida, East Tampa Business and Civic Association, and hi to all my classmates who just finished training with Dave Kramer. My question is, how do you deal with clients who are continuously late? I only have one that's late every single month. On the three approaches. Um, well, uh, we ACH all of our payments. Um, we set all of these purchases up on, a on ACH. Now, sometimes we have had a couple that, but, that um, the money wasn't there. But it's really, I'm fortunate to say that we, we, we haven't, we don't, we haven't ran into that problem. We ran into account, account number change, changing and things like that, but some of that on an ACH seems to do, do the best to counteract those late payments, if you are able to. Okay. Well, I can ask my uh, housing, uh, my uh, city of Tampa and see what they say, see if they'll allow us to do it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, Diane. And uh, one final question here from uh, Bob Jones, and then we'll move on. Hi, Bob. Uh, hi, this is Bob Jones, City of Springfield, Missouri. Uh, we're an NSP1 recipient. We have a, a under a uh, we have about 20 houses that are partly rehabbed, and we're looking at instead of selling them to doing the lease purchase. Uh, how do you handle? I know some of the earlier discussion talked about the $500 uh, application fee and $1,000 application fee. Is that is that also a security or cleaning deposit? And have they had problems? They said something about 15% of them don't don't roll over and purchase uh, when they leave if the house is trashed. And do they allow pets? Okay, let me start with the pets. Uh, we don't prohibit pets. Um, remember, we have to buy the property. The client actually picked out the property, so before we. When we're ready to do the purchase contract on that, they have to put their skin in the game at that point. And it's what we call a pre-purchase agreement. They put in their 500 or their 1,000. Now, that would go towards a deposit. So, for example, we have had one young lady that decided lease purchase wasn't for her. Um, and she did move out. The first thing our property management people do is they go in, they check the house completely, and uh, any repairs that have to be made beyond some normal wear and tear, simple wear and tear, is taken first out of that deposit they made. If we should get one that trashes it and that 500 or 1,000 doesn't cover it, then we go into the funds that we have been setting aside for them. Now, our program does not, we do not keep those funds if they don't, if they don't go on to home ownership. We will return that but only after that house is in perfect condition again. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And uh, at this point, um, good questions, everyone. Thanks. And, uh, keep those coming. We'll break again for questions uh, after we hear from Bill Brett of Columbus Housing Partnership. Hi, Bill. Thank, Thank you, Jen. If I could just give a brief introduction, uh, Bill comes to us as a veteran of uh, asset management, uh, primarily with uh, Columbus Housing Partnership, which has a huge portfolio. Uh, but also, I should note that uh, Bill does training uh, at the NeighborWorks uh, Training Institute in uh, asset management and actually uh, does a course in scattered site property management. So he comes at it from a practitioner's perspective as well as someone who trains on this. So very grateful to have Bill uh, join us. So take us from there, Bill. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Kent. So panelists and attendees, um, yeah, Columbus Housing Partnership is based in Columbus, Ohio. I'll get my little paid political announcement uh, done. Um, we have about 2,000 rental units. Uh, of which about 400 of them are scattered site, primarily single-family homes. Uh, we've been in that arena. The, most of them have been financed through the low-income housing tax credit program, and we've been in that arena uh, beginning over 15 years ago. We have some that are just coming 
uh, to their expiration of their 15-year compliance uh, period. So those that were lease option tax credit deals now were working through the uh, preparing the buyers for ownership uh, financially and credit counseling, et cetera. So we're just in the process of going through all that. But at CHP, we have uh, really four lines of business. We have home sales, uh, which touches on a lot of the similarities of what you folks are experiencing. Uh, we also have a rental living department, which gets into, you know, designed rental living. Um, we have a housing advisory center that gets into foreclosure prevention and home buyer education and credit counseling and that sort of thing. And we have a community life or resident services uh, line of business as well. And it's interesting as time goes on to see how all those different lines of businesses come to interact. Um, for example, in our rental living side, we have our development folks go out and put the uh, planned rental property together. And as asset management, we've begun to work in the last few years closer and closer together with that rental living group to help them from a design standpoint of a product and what we want as a rental product. So uh, you know, as uh, our Homes for Sale division has uh, emerged through with the NSP funds and some of those things, They've said to chat with us that, okay, hey, if this house doesn't sell, what should we be looking at from a rental standpoint? You know, typically in a house, you would put carpet in the living area and carpet up the stairs and in the bedrooms, perhaps. And in our rental portfolio, we put a uh, uh, wood look-alike type product called the Lure from Home Depot that looks like wooden plank. Uh, material in the living area, and they have one that looks like tile, slate tile, that we put in the kitchens and the bathrooms. And what we find is it's probably about twice the cost to you know, buy and install it, but in terms of maintaining it, we don't have to replace it every three to five years like you would in a typical rental product. So in some of those uh, homes that are initially intended for sale, uh, but out in perhaps a neighborhood or an area that, you know, the sale is certainly not uh, guaranteed or something that might happen in the near future, we've been putting that product in uh, so that if it does become a rental, it'll help us to maintain, uh, keep our maintenance costs down. Um, and it's an attractive product, too. So we're actually getting some folks that are interested in going with that versus carpet in the homes that they're purchasing. Um you know, the tough part with scattered site is that it's not like your traditional apartment communities where you have an office building that's surrounded by 50 or 100 or 200 apartment units. Uh, as a manager in that type of a community, you can pull in and drive around the site and in about 15, 20 minutes kind of get a good feel for what went on the night before and is there any damage or do they have a party again over in the corner uh, building? Uh, when you get into scatter sites and you're managing it uh, with 400 rental units, if we wanted to drive by every one of those units, it would probably take us a week to do that. Um, so when you're looking at uh, you know, how, to, how to keep your eye on uh, that product and, and maintain it, uh, it, it, it's a lot more labor intensive and therefore more costly. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Uh, new market tax credits and single family scattered sites. Uh, we've been fortunate in that anything that we build using the new market tax credits and coupling with other forms of financing that we've been able to uh, attract a buyer, uh, because the incentives are there. Um, Bill, you know, Bill, this is Kent. Can I interrupt for a second? Are you able sure. to advance your slides? Yes. Okay. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> Sometimes I engage the uh, the mouse and the brain doesn't follow. So thank you, Kent. Um, no worries. Okay. So the new market tax for the single family scattered. Uh, we, we haven't had to get into that a whole lot, as I mentioned. But from a product design standpoint and looking ahead, uh, there's been definitely interaction between the, the various groups. Uh, near market rate downtown condos, uh, right before the 
housing market uh, took a tank, uh, we made the decision to get into uh, some convert a building near our headquarters uh, into condos. And after trying to sell those, um, you know, construction completed right about the peak of the housing market, and so sales uh, weren't going. There's probably about 18 units that uh, weren't going where the way we had anticipated. So uh, we've actually uh, converted some of those to lease options, and uh, uh, have those in our portfolio on the rental side of it. Uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the majority of our 400 units are uh, 15 year low income housing tax credit units uh, that are coming into their uh, 15 year compliance period and then and the end of this year and, and every year for the next couple years. You know, so I mentioned some of the uh, working with construction and design on, on some of the different features. Um, you know, the operational side of it, um, as we're uh, talking to the different groups, and in particular the course that I teach, uh, there's a number of folks that are in that course that, you know, it's a planned program. We're, we plan to get into rental housing. Um, I would say they're probably outnumbered by three or four to one for the folks that are like, well, it wasn't our intention. We just ended up in the rental game. And... Um, you know, that short term of time and, and weighing, you know, what happens if this doesn't sell? Uh, because getting into the management side of it, it's, it's tough, it's tricky. Um, there's a lot of folks that uh, can do that uh, well internally if there's a handful of units and they're close to their central offices. Um, if they're not close or if they really don't have anybody that understands that game, then that can be uh, the downfall of some of the organizations. Um, and the, the, the short-term balance of managing it and encouraging ownership, it takes a lot of coaching. We've looked uh, into and just brought aboard a housing coach that uh, we really don't want to call it a salesperson, but you mentioned how do you keep the residents coming to the classes because we have, even with our 15-year tax credit, we have an internal maintenance and external maintenance and a landscape class that they are required to attend in the first three years of their 15-year period. Then they're required to attend them again uh, through the course of their tenure in the house as well. So this housing coach has helped us to make sure that they're taking the classes, they're staying on top of things, talks to them about rentals. Uh, they work closely with our housing counseling folks on the uh, counseling, one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions, uh, coordinating them. Uh, they work with them on the high home buyer education, making sure that they've attended the classes and are thinking about those sorts of things. So that encouraging doesn't just happen on its own. You have to have somebody that can take the time and the effort to follow through with that. Um, even, even, even with short term, it's still an asset that has to be maintained. Uh, it's still a, man, a matter of keeping your eye on it and making sure that the property is, is, is being maintained and, and uh, encourage the residents to take those steps that they're required to, in order to uh, move into that home ownership mode. Um, the special challenge of a scattered site, you know, there is no on-site manager. Um, there's, again, that challenge of we ask our, we have third-party management company that manages our 400 units, and we ask them to at least drive by the property once a week. And not just, you know, drive by it, but the front and the back, you know, make sure that things are being maintained the way they should be. Um, it is a different type of property management. It's uh, uh, totally different, again, than, than the, the manager that can just drive to the property in 10 minutes and understand what's going on. It's training the maintenance staff that if they're on a work order at this unit and they see that we own a house across the street or they pass one along the way, that if they see something, point it out, phone it in, 
get a work order, get it taken care of. Uh, with scatter site, reducing windshield time is critical. Where you don't want a, a resident calling in saying my blind is broken and the maintenance guy gets in his vehicle, drives over, measures the blind, goes to Home Depot, stops for a cup of coffee on the way, you know, gets to Home Depot, doesn't quite have the blind they need, goes back to the house to make sure that the one that he can get will fit it. You know, so the windshield time is critical. Uh, our management companies have a database on each house so that when a work order is phoned in, they can pull up the database. They have the measurements of every window. They have the the, the uh, manufacturer and the model number of every refrigerator and stove. They have the measurement of every room for carpet or, or, or tile so that when a work order is phoned in, they don't have to send somebody there to measure. They've got it all in their database so that they can uh, put the parts in a vehicle the night before and send somebody out the next day to do the work order because that windshield time will, will actually kill you. Um, the no uniform equipment, uh, you know, faucets and that sort of thing, it creates a challenge if you're trying to cut down that windshield time. Is it, um, you know, how do you inventory those parts so that uh, if, if it's a belt or a moan faucet that you've got the replacement parts so the guy's not, you know, taking his trip back and forth to Home Depot. Uh, we've gone in some cases and actually changed out faucets so that they're all alike so that, and, and again, that's something for the design standpoint when you're looking at uh, homes for sale that might turn to rentals. In our rental market, we've tried to set a spec so that the faucets are the same. So if the home sells, it's got a nice faucet in it. If it doesn't sell and becomes a rental, it's the same faucet that we have in our rental homes. So when we go to maintain it, we know what's in there and we can inventory the parts. Um, so there's some cost-benefit analysis um, that's done for that to make sure that uh, we're being efficient. Um, you know, other, you know, creating the eyes and ears, you know, some of the things that we've already discussed, an interesting uh, byproduct of scattered housing is that you have a house that you've decided not to sell but to put it up for rent. You put a sign out front. Does that sign really say for rent or does it say free copper, free appliances, you know, come break into me because there's nobody at home? You know, so it gets into a whole different ballgame on how do you market that product and how do you uh, uh, keep that uh, product from getting vandalized, sometimes in, in some less than wonderful neighborhoods. How do you rent that product? Do you have somebody call into a central office? Do you have the prospective renter meet you at the office and then follow you over? Or do you put them in your car, which I hope people aren't doing, um, do you meet them at the house? How long do you have to sit there and wait? Is it okay for one person to go by themselves, or do you need to have a team go over to the house for safety purposes? So those are a lot of things you have to consider when you're thinking about the different aspects of managing the scattered sites. Um, you know, the handling lease purchasers differently in regards to maintenance. We have the classes. We teach the folks how to maintain it. Some of them do a very good job of it, and some of them um, don't do as well. And for various reasons, either they just don't get it or they may not be handy. Um, you know, there's other folks that it may be a single mom with kids. They don't have the time to get out and do some of the maintenance that they would like to do. So how do you deal with that? You know, do you do it for them and charge them for it? Can they afford to do it and not do it? Uh, so those are some of the different uh, aspects that you have to think about when you're thinking about jumping into the program. And I believe that's all for now. Okay. And any questions? Thank you, Bill. Uh, yeah, we do have... Hello? Hi, uh, I had a question regarding... Um, uh, the rehab aspect of your uh, program, if you just have any tips or suggestions on managing a large-scale single-family scatter site 
rehab program. We've had to sort of grapple with some of those issues over the last two years as we've uh, gotten a large number of units all in a very short period of time by virtue of NSP contracts. Um, also related to that, I was curious as to whether your organization acts as a general contractor yourself. And uh, then thirdly related, uh, if there's any special software or other tools that you use to track the status of acquisition rehab. Um, and you did mention, I heard the database that the property management company uses to help track the specs of products in each of your houses. Okay. Um, handling major rehab, the best way is to find the best contractor that you can, provide a lot of input up front. Um, you know, we try to, without getting cookie cutter, we try to standardize as much as possible, you know, so that when it comes to the, you know, short term or long term, the, 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 the cost of managing that, uh, unit is, greatly reduced by having some consistency in the products and the parts and the, uh, you know, even things like interior paint. Um, you know, we don't, we don't use flat and semi-gloss flat in the living area and semi-gloss in the wet areas. Mm -hmm. We use eggshell throughout, for example. Uh, and we use pretty much the same color, you know, so that we're not, you know, storing two different types of paint, same color, but different sheens. Um, so again, standardizing as much as possible, having a good contractor. Um, we have a construction oversight department within our organization that then hires a general contractor to do the work. I see. So that we are overseeing the general contractor, but he's the one that's really out there doing the day to day. Mm -hmm. um, and software. Um, you know, managing the properties, there comes a tipping point where, you know, you can set up, you know, if you have a half a dozen units, you can set up some nice Excel spreadsheets and keep track of, you know, payments and, um, you know, whatever, whatever it is you need to keep track of. No, we're north of 200 units, so we're trying to mechanize wherever we can. Yeah, I mean, it, and that's where it gets tough because software is not cheap. Um, you know, Yardy is probably one of the Cadillacs in the industry. Um, you know, and Yardy has helped us to really hone in on our costs and our expenses. They keep track of, you know, this database that I mentioned that you're able to integrate that into the Yardy maintenance side of it. Um, you know, but it's, uh, it's about $3,000 a year per legal entity. And uh, probably about uh, ten dollars a unit a month to maintain it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're starting to get into the over really a hundred units and and really two hundred units, it, it would be ideal to help manage your portfolio. Right, and I was also wondering how uh, more so um, on the acquisition and rehab period before the people move in. Software to manage that that period. We pretty much have a pretty strong accounting department that you know that handles that end of the record keeping. But I've been here. Uh, we've, we've utilized and been subscribers of Community Central, but have had a hard time. I don't know if you're familiar with Community Central. Have had a hard time kind of getting it up and running and getting our staff um, who, who are managing our project managers managing the acquisition and rehab phase before the property moves into property management. Um, so I was just wondering if you or any, maybe any of the other, other folks had experience with a software that, tool that helps with that as well. I, I am not familiar with the software that our development guys use, um, so I really couldn't answer that for you. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kaya. Any, uh, anybody else have uh, anything to add to uh, the answer to her questions? I, I'm surprised, Kent, you're not mentioning Developer Pro as the uh, the software for managing acquisition and construction. 
understands the program, we train them in it, and they work directly with the client and go out and, and, and pick out the home for the client. Now, occasionally when we have a house to sell, we definitely use real estate agents. Yeah, we, just don't have the, uh, we just don't have the staff and how to be out showing properties and things like that. Uh, one of the things I mentioned that I uh, neglected to mention when the presentation is that, uh, you know, when you get a renter in a home, Ohio uh, recently changed their tenant landlord law on uh, just cause for eviction purposes. That in the past, if you had a, a rental home and you were interested in having that person purchase the home, and they chose not to, or other folks in the neighborhood said, we don't like their pink flamingos on their front lawn. Um, and so the developer said, well, we better find somebody that's going to fit the rest of the neighborhood. At the end of their lease, you might give them a notice that says, you know, sorry, uh, we're not going to renew your lease. And it really was because we didn't think you were able to or didn't want you to be a homeowner uh, in this neighborhood. And so Ohio passed a law that says you have to have just cause in order to non-renew a lease or to, to terminate a lease. And so it's something that, you know, you really, when you talk about your selection criteria and the folks that you're putting in there, you have to look, you know, pretty pretty strong on the front end uh, to make sure you're getting somebody in there that's going to comply and, and, and meet your needs. Well, we're waiting to see if uh, more questions come in. Let me take a moment to remind you that this webinar will be archived on the NSP Resource Exchange website. It will include an AV recording of today's event along with a PDF version of a uh, copy of the slides you've seen. Uh, and uh, soon it will also include a written transcript. That takes a little bit longer to get posted to process and post, but it will be there soon. And also, uh, upcoming NSP webinars, a host of them uh, heading into no October and November. And uh, if there's any here that float your boat, please join us for those. Uh, Ho Shang from uh, HUD in Southern California has been a wealth of information. He suggests uh, 
creating an online training program for realtors and certifying them where you ask them to list their cell phones to the buyers. You know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of organizations handle that uh, in you know, kind of more uh, in-person ways, too, with uh, information sessions to the agents to discuss the program with them and uh, engage their interest. questions come in in the next minute or two. At this point, I would uh, uh, turn it over or give, give Hunter or any of the other folks at HUD a chance to say anything if you've got comments out there in D.C. Yeah, uh, and this is John Laswick. I was wondering if uh, any of the panelists could comment on the kind of decision process of going it sounds like most of these programs started out to be a sales uh, program and then uh, ran into problems. Um, and I'm just curious, kind of when that when that tipping point was, and what the what what the factors were that that made them decide that they really weren't going to it wasn't going to work at least in the short run as a as a sales program because uh, you know then you get into these issues of the materials and finishes and the and the homes and so forth and if you if you decide too late you don't, you don't you've already got the carpeting in and that sort of thing so but I'm more interested in the you know what what tipped them uh, to to a lease program. I think that's more for Bill because we knew we were going to, CDC knew it was going to do lease at the very front end because we knew how tough it was going to be to get people totally qualified for home ownership in the amount of time that we had. What I've heard in, in, in the classes that I teach is that it's a myriad of things that, you know, they had set a time frame with which to sell it and then it didn't happen. Uh, other circumstances, it was in an area that was being vandalized. Um, you know, uh, you know the, the holding costs were, uh, you know, could be uh, conversations have different criteria that they use. I mean, some of them, it didn't sell in three months, and they're ready to rent it. Others, you know, they had been... You know, on the market for a year, um, and it still hadn't sold. So that's when they decided to kind of start thinking about rental. Um, you know, so you know, each organization had various criteria and different tipping points. Thanks. Uh, any any final? Uh Comments. Oh, wait, let's see. We do have a little bit more here. Dave, let me uh, yeah. back over to, uh, to these for you. All right, just, just to reiterate that um, <clears throat> the documents that I refer to, the Policy and Procedures Manual, uh, it's sample, a sample lease agreement that incorporates the strategy of a renewable lease uh, the financial three-part pro forma and uh, uh, others related to lease purchase are all in the toolkit, uh, the NSP toolkit, and it is one section, whole section of the toolkit. And the toolkit uh, can be found uh, in the uh, basic website address of NSP Help. And it uh, uh, got info, and it's under resources, so you'll find it uh, in that particular section. Uh, but don't stop there. There are other features of the NSP website that you can find uh, past uh, questions and answers, kind of a basic fact area, and as well as other training material, including uh, past uh, webinars, as well as other presentations. And that's also the portal for asking questions, and uh, you'll get an answer, uh, usually within a week or two. 
and uh, that can be raised through that portal as well, as well as requesting technical assistance. And uh, so that is uh, the portal for that as well. So uh, go to those websites as indicated on the chart, and uh, you have access to all kinds of assistance that uh, is available. We do have another question that just came in from uh, Vincent. Hi, Vincent, are you there? Yes, hello. Hi. Can you hear me? We sure can. Oh, thank you, Sean. I noticed with a problem with selling these properties and then we have the, these options. I know we can have a, where a non-profit can buy it and sell it, but how about if you had equity sharing where uh, um, uh, uh, investors can earn and, and currently own uh, have 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 heard looking looking to that idea of something along those lines. Well, I can take the first crack at that. Um, this is Dave Kramer again. Uh, I know that the whole equity sharing notion is floating out there. There's lots of uh, uh, white papers on it that you Google equity sharing. I've never seen it happen um, when a lease purchase is combined a nonprofit partners with a, an investor uh, to incorporate equity into the deal, except for the uh, low-income housing tax credit or new market tax credit that Bill Brett uh, mentioned, and, and others are doing the 15-year, but purely as an investment. Uh, particularly in a short-term lease purchase, I have not seen that done yet. The reason why I brought it up, I know years ago, when things got tight back in the 80s, they were doing equity sharing, so I, I, I kind of dated myself um, in some places. But now with the um, LLCs, we even have limited liability corporations where maybe an um, investor can own the property, you uh, own part of it, Give the tax write off to someone else, or you know, just so many ways they can do it now. I just, I just, just, just wonder if that part of the law could be relaxed. In the fact, looking at the fact that the banks are not giving out money, it's hard to sell them, and you might have an investor who can afford the property, but can use it for a tax write off until that that other person can own it, and they have a part, a part ownership in it. Okay, um, now I understand your question better. Um, what you're referring to is others might refer to as a land installment contract or uh, yes, uh, yes, yes. payment for deed contract. And this was often in the past, the distant past, referred to as lease purchase. And that's actually structured very differently than the model that we were discussing today, uh, where there is immediate uh, uh, equity interest because uh, as the uh, mortgage or the property is being pulled, uh, 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 paid off, there is actually a growing equity interest and at some percentage point, a uh, tipping point, then the full title is transferred over. Uh, it was used by a lot of uh, inner city landlords in some of the Rust Belt cities. Uh, it's sometimes used in the uh, colonia section and rural areas of uh, the colonias uh, by major landlords. Unfortunately, it was often uh, misused uh, by sponsors and uh, gave that whole technique uh, a bad reputation, and that spilled over into people thought we purchase, as we're describing it today was the same thing, and it gave it a bad reputation. There is actually a group in uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul that's using, uh, and in Detroit, that have gone back to this concept where it is sponsored actually by a nonprofit, and it's called a land installment, and uh, so that practice has been brought back, and uh, it, it is being used. Uh, so... Uh, that, that may help you. 
Yeah, the, uh, this is John. We, we've had some problems with the uh, contract for deed, but it's an interesting concept the way you bring it up. I mean, potentially it, it, it could be structured in a safe enough way. It, it might bring some additional capital into the program or return some of the, uh, the grantees capital at an earlier point so they can do more units, but I think it is susceptible to uh, problems as, uh, as a straight contract for deed, and we've only allowed it in Minnesota where they have a specific law uh, that, um, that that regulates it. Um, in most places, it's it's, uh, it's seen as a high risk kind of seller financing, but uh, but it'd be interesting to you know kind of push that a little bit. I mean, it's, it's sort of a hybrid between lease purchase and and uh, and you know kind of an investor owner model. So, um, but I. Uh, we really haven't seen that uh, to this point. Okay. Um, so, one more slide from you, Ted, right? Um, I think that's actually the survey that uh, you're asking folks to take, and you might want to say a little bit about that, Kent. But before you do, uh, let me again uh, thank the panelists uh, for taking the time uh, to prepare for this. Uh, to be a part of this and to share their experience with everyone. I think when uh, folks on the ground that are actual uh, practitioners share their stories, it helps bring uh, what we talk about sometimes in theory back into reality. So uh, uh, I to uh, give a, a hand out to all those that participated. Thank you. Indeed. I'll echo that. And uh, thanks. To all the participants for being here today, the reason we uh, did this in the first place, we appreciate your questions. I uh, hope to see you soon at another NFC webinar. And as you leave, you'll be automatically taken to a survey form, and we'd appreciate you taking just a minute or two to give us some feedback on this webinar and what you'd like to see in the future. And uh, your written comments are uh, particularly helpful there. So that's it for today's. NSP webinar, and uh, thank everyone very much, and take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.